Build Aid Media, powered by builders and supported by Mix 93.8 FM and SA Garden and Home, are proud to bring you this homeowner workshop series. Throughout this 10-part series, we will be showcasing a wide variety of industry specialists to ensure a positive building experience. In this episode, Get Structured, we will highlight the importance of proper planning of the key structural elements when designing and building. The specialist presenters are Dave Ledbetter from Claybrook, Uwe Schlitter from Mitec, Paul Lowe from Jiprock, and Willem Crofier from Coverland. Your host is Graham Alexander from Build Aid Media. Dave, just quickly, tell us a little about the Claybrick Association. Um, Graham, effectively, the, Cla the Claybrick Association is simply a regulatory body. There are a huge amount of, of regulations to adhere to and safety. Um, of staff and personnel on a property, so it really just liaises with government and ensures compliance to, to the requirements. Every drawing you pick up, or almost every, well, I wouldn't say every drawing, most of them, um, we look at the drawing and it's assumed that we're using brick walls. Now that's not always the case. You know, our, our slide behind us there shows people building with, with, with hay bales, which is unusual in South Africa, very unusual. But the assumption is made um, that, it's, that it's brick walls. If we could just look at some of the types of bricks. Effectively, there's, there's the clay as material and there's concrete as material. Um, you get blocks, I mean, SANS 2 to 7 um, prescribes that a brick must be rectangular in shape and it must be 48 to 54 bricks in a square meter. So what you see on the screen, um, so the previous screen uh, with these blocks, is not actually a brick, it's a block. Um, they're typically used in um, sort of low-end warehousing, they're used for RDP housing, um, certainly not, then, not in Danefern and Stain City and the likes. Um, concrete as a material has the issue thermal, uh, thermal properties are an issue, um, expansion and contraction. Concrete, when it is wet, it expands and when it, dry, um, uh, when it dries out, it shrinks, you know, and this leads to cracking. Um, so there are people out there who use concrete uh, plaster bricks and then they'll use a clay, um, say a face brick, and those bricks have different movement characteristics which leads to cracking and failure and moisture ingress. So looking at some of the, some of the bricks on the on the slide there, um, Dave. Just to and obviously there there are probably hundreds of different types of, of face brick, but just run us through so we understand one you can plaster, one you can't plaster, um, and you can't use a non a plaster brick as a face and so on. Um, what do we need to know about those bricks? Essentially, there's two types of brick. There's a there's a plaster brick and there's a face brick. Um, now within that you get two types of plaster brick, you get a plaster brick and it's simply it is to be rendered. You cannot use it as a face brick application, it is not made for that, it is porous, um, it is not fired to the same degree as, as a face brick. You also get a high strength plaster brick. Um, this is typically used for foundations, it is also called the foundation brick. Um, needless to say the foundations support the entire structure so the, the quality of, of brick going into the foundation is probably the most crucial element. Once you get above ground level, then you get you can either plaster it or, um, with a clay brick, um, or you can use a face brick. Now, within face brick, again, there are three different types of brick. This face brick aesthetic. It is produced to be non-uniform in size, non-uniform in shape, non-uniform in color. Anything goes as long as it's rectangle, rectangular in shape, and has 17 MPa as a compressive strength. You get face brick standard FBS for sugar. Um, it's a brick that got certain tolerance requirements that they have to meet. Um, and there's no so Dave, requirement on colour. As, as a homeowner, one would think, you know, do I need to know this technical stuff? And, and you may or may um, not need to know that. But you'll see later in the show where we say, get involved. When you, you're building your home, get involved with the design, ask questions. And some of these technicalities have a bearing on other things, Dave, like price possibly. Certainly an FBA brick. Um, the common terminology within the industry is um, semi-face. Now that's like being half pregnant. You know, you get a face brick, you get a plaster brick. Um, uh, a semi-face brick or an FBA brick, a brick that's produced to be deliberately non-uniform in shape. Your mortar costs go up dramatically because it's not uniform. Your joint sizes are massively um, increased. Now if you take cement, mortar is typically a thousand rand a cube these days. Um, you know, if you've got a, a, instead of a 12 mil mortar joint, you've suddenly got 15 or 20, you know, it's, it's gone up by 25%. And suddenly your mortar, um, your mortar budget has gone through the roof. With design trends, um, 
you don't see too many face brick houses anymore that are completely face brick, as you did maybe 40, 50 years ago. Correct me if I'm wrong, Dave. But you do see a lot of what, what is up on the slide, where you're using feature walls inside and out. Is, is that, do you find that to be the trend as a manufacturer? Certainly it is. Um, I have a team of staff that call on architects and we follow trends both locally and overseas. And the, the days of a complete face brick house, even we say it's, it's ugly, but it, clay brick being a natural product, it blends in with natural rock, artificial rock, with, with timber, with steel, glass, and you get different colours of glass and there's, there's a wide range of colours of, um, in, in clay face brick. So if you've got green glass, you know, you, you can have a contrasting thing. And that's really up to a homeowner from an aesthetics point of view. But mixed elements is very much a trend. Feature walls, um, as you see on the slide, um, the architects we've been seeing recently, um, really at the start of this year, saying face brick is the second coming. Yeah, we see a, we see a lot of it um, going through, through our professional offices. What are the, what are the real benefits of of using a, a face brick? Right, well, using a face brick, the, the first one and the obvious one is aesthetics. Um, it's pretty, but the main one is it doesn't need maintenance. Uh, a plastered home, I mean, doesn't need, you don't need to plaster it. The lifetime of the building, which is typically regarded as a 50 year um, life cycle. The thermal properties of clay as a material, um, it is the most thermally efficient. Uh, clay doesn't burn a clay brick. A clay face brick doesn't burn. Um, acoustic properties, uh, noise is airborne. Um, clay as a heavy material simply um, creates a, a quiet environment. Here's the million dollar question, Dave. So I want to use face brick. How does it compare to plaster and paint from a cost point of view? Consumers typically look at a price and say, how much is a plaster brick? And typically today, one rand 20, one rand 30 a brick. And a face brick, a mid-range face brick is, say, four rand. That's, whoa, that's expensive. The thing with a plaster brick is that's not the end of the job. The job. <coughs> you have to then um, plaster it, obviously, which is more material. You then have to wait for it and apply your undercoat. And then you go back and you apply your first coat of paint. And you go back and you apply your second coat of paint. So once you've taken all the other issues into account, the cost of plaster and paint today is around 120 to 130 rand a square meter. So really the, the sort of tip or hint to a, a homeowner or home builder would be look at the in-wall cost, not at the cost of, the, of, of brick A or brick B, um, the, the cost of the individual components, look at the in-wall cost and a brick of about, a face brick of about four rand a brick is on par with um, a plastered and painted finish once it is built and completed and you're handed the keys. And then the benefits of maintenance free is an add-on cherry on top of that. So you can keep the money to go on holiday down to Plet or wherever. So hopefully we, we're sort of understanding that a brick's not just a brick. We need to understand what it is, what does it look like, where can we use it. Now generally the architect should be guiding you with this. But you may have seen a photograph and said, Mr. Architect, I would like my kitchen to to look like that. Ask the right questions. A lot of contractors, or not a lot, many contractors over the years have been using um, bricks that are not the right strength, as Dave was saying, in the, in the foundations or for double story buildings. Now as homeowners, you probably wouldn't know that. Um, and, and, and I wouldn't blame you for not knowing that, unless you do a lot of reading or read some of Bill Dade's books. Um, ask those questions. But if you've employed your contractor at the right price, as we'll see later, you shouldn't be doing that in the first place. Um, Dave, what services does Corabric offer um, architects and homeowners um, from a specification technical point of view? How long is a piece of string? Um, typically, they would look at it, they'd go to visit an architect, understand what the, they're working on and what the client wants, understand budgets, understand the, the locality, because if you have different requirements. If someone is building at the coast, and many people, I think, in the audience would may, maybe have a holiday home. If you're in a sea spray zone, um, suddenly you have corrosive salts. If you're um, 30 kilometers from the coast, you have a different requirement, and inland, um, for, in terms of the uh, the length of a, the, the uh, life cycle of a brick, um, you're not in a corrosive environment. 
Um, there are trends, we pick up on trends. I mean, many architects have come to Coral Brick and sort of said, um, we're looking for a dark grey brick because it's fashionable. And maybe it's because of 50 shades of grey, but grey is enormously <laughs> fashionable at the moment. And we have developed a range of, of grey bricks, ranging from a light grey to a dark grey. Um, we're now introducing, it's coming to market um, probably next month, um, textured bricks, um, applied surface coating. You know, if you look at that slide there, the grey feature walls, um, they will supply samples that the architects can supply it and present it to a homeowner. Um, they will look at complementary products, uh, paving. Um, it's really wide range. And in terms of supply, there's a chain of merchants. You see builders all over the place. Builders Warehouse does sell um, coral brick brick. Coral brick's got its own, um, the six coral brick centers. They sort of specialist centers. The local one around here is across from um, Leopold Prison in, in Kyle Army. But they're scattered around, around Gauteng and 28 around the country where the homeowner can go see a full range of brick and really engage in people, look at material, look at concepts, uh, the creative use of brick. Um, a brick doesn't have to be laid in this flat stretcher bond. There's nothing to stop you doing it in a, in a soldier course sure. and using special shaped bricks as a range of special shaped bricks to create architectural features. Um, it's unlimited. It's really... Clay, the use of clay brick and face brick is limited to the architect's creativity. If you can design it, it can be made. I'm from Coverland. We are actually the oldest roof tile company, concrete roof tile company in South Africa. We were established in 1949. Um, we are the biggest. We've got nine manufacturing sites around South Africa. We supply a range of concrete tiles. We also do a bit of imported clay tiles for, you know, for some unique applications and some of the systems that go with it, uh, underlays. Uh, we can, we'll talk about a, a system called dry ridge and some flashing applications as well. But just a little bit about Coverland. I know you covered it um, um, earlier on. What are the Monia Coverland thing? Could you just quickly explain that yeah, to us and which one's your website? <laughs> yeah. yeah, we actually, we're part of a, a multinational group. Uh, we, we belong to a company called Brass Monnier in Germany. So we've got a lot of heritage from a lot of our products get tested in, and, and approved. And we actually source product from Germany. So everything that we sell to you has to go through a rigid, rigid testing in, in, in Germany. We've recently been bought by a company in, called Standard Industries. Uh, they're American, also part of the, uh, a big multinational uh, housing as such uh, conglomerate. Um, so we, we, things are changing slightly, but we, we still get the same sort of uh, uh, quality f products that, that you expect from us. When do you think, um, Willem, the homeowner needs to get involved with thinking? I mean, I know what I would say but <laughs> as a manufacturer. Yeah, I think if, you know, when you go buy a car, you, you, you know sort of what it what must look like, what color it should have. So there's an, an aesthetic element to it. And it's, it's the same with when you build a roof. You've got, a, you've got something in your mind when you decide, I'm going to build a house and this is what I want it to look like. And, you know, it, it inevitably will have a roof depending on what it looked like, whether it's a, like I say, a pitch roof or a flat roof or a, a barn style roof. So you, you will decide, okay, this is the style I want. And then you've got to start talking about, okay, what Okay, what sort of covering is it? Is it a metal roof? Is it a clay roof? Is it concrete? Uh, and then based on all those elements, okay, what quality level in those do you yeah. do, I, do I take into to account? Because if all that adds to the cost again. We'll see in a moment um, how many concrete roof tiles are available. But one thinks of sh metal sheeting as metal sheeting. There are at least 30 or 40 different types of metal sheeting with different coatings, different painting, and, and so on. I just want to mention, Willem, a couple of the um, roofs that are not used that often, like um, clay roof tiles or um, cover tiles, pressed metal tiles. I think Harvey Tile is quite a well-known brand. Yes. Um, fiber cement roof slates, natural roof slates, which are beautiful but a bit expensive. Shingles, sort of, you don't see too many of those anymore. But let's look at the common um, roof types and um, Willem, starting with, with um, um, the yeah, concrete we, tiles. Yeah, we've, yeah can we, we can run through those, those as well. You know, there's a lot of, uh, we, we sell concrete tiles, so that's, it's, it's probably the easiest product to get around or to, to get hold of. And um, uh, these are some of our, our tiles. And so they're, they're really available. There's a lot of manufacturers. 
Um, most manufacturers are SABS approved. Um, these tiles have to be manufactured according to a certain standard. There are guys, yes, you can get a cheaper tile from a guy who is not SABS approved, but is that where you want to risk uh, on your roof? It is above you. It's like if you don't, don't have a, a decent truss manufacturer or, or truss system applied and bad tiles, it could be um, quite dangerous for, for your family just to save a few rand. Uber mentioned earlier, and I know Bill Dade have worked out the same exercise, um, that concrete roof tile is the most cost-effective roof. Um, it's been worked out on a fairly simple roof, but one mustn't make the mistake of thinking that sheeting is some kind of a cheap roof. Mm. Um, it's not necessarily the case. And um, Willem, there's a barn, um, I said, a sort of um, farmhouse style, which has been very popular for the last sort of five to ten years. Yeah. But that could quite easily be a, a flat tile, flat concrete tile. Yes. I think even my wife likes a, like, a, like the, this type of, of, of roof. And it's like, yes, it's, it, it looks pretty, but it also has, you know, each type of roof covering has their, their limitations or, or, uh, or facets that, that you need to consider. Like, yes, it's, it's, it looks pretty, but it's hotter. Uh, it's also very noisy when it rains. Uh, we can, can have some, some of our... Uh, St. Cobain products to keep the noise levels down, uh, but but it's also it's, it's it's what like I said earlier, it's what you what you want as a homeowner. Uh, what what style suits yeah. you? Let me look day. at flat roofs. Um, yeah, flat yeah. roofs are quite popular in very modern architecture. Uh, they uh, they are very unique. Uh, it looks looks very pretty. They also have their their drawbacks. Uh, waterproofing is always a big issue on a, on a on a flat roof. And I don't, haven't heard any person yet that have, has a flat roof that has not had an issue with the waterproofing <laughs> of, of those roofs. And another type of roof now, smiles, mono, yeah. <laughs> sorry, that was, I need mist, clay tiles. Clay tiles, uh, yeah, th th they're a very niche bit in the market. Uh, uh, we bring in a range of clay tiles from, from Spain, Italy, uh, Portugal, even from Germany. So uh, they, it gives you a whole different look of tile. You, you, possibly get that Mediterranean look. But then also we've got some quite modern, uh, funky flat tiles uh, from, from, from Italy that, or from Spain, which, which you can have a look at outside. And they are, uh, we use them in Zabali now on one of their, and, and it, it's a very pretty and it's, it's so unique and so it's such clean lines. So yes, you've got some of the old school charm, like one of these estates in, in the Western Cape, uh, or we've got like a proper modern uh, tile. Um, in clay as well. Mm. Back to Willem with um, design style um, dictating roof coverings. I think we just went through those, mm. those pictures. Let's focus now on concrete, on, on actual concrete tiles. That's what you guys mm. uh, manufacture and you import um, clay tiles. There's a, an example of what's available there, um, Willem. Now just, just interesting, I think most people, of, most of you will notice the top right, yes, top right, the double Roman tile. When you, when you get a plan, a lot of times we get plans across our table and it says concrete tile or it just says double Roman. Um, and then it's a, it's a five million rand house. And you think, like seriously? <laughs> you know, if you have a five million rand house, you're not going to have a, like a, depending if you inclined to have a very vintage car in your house, you're not going to have an old skadonk in your house, you know? So everything needs to sort of be proportionate. So... Design your roof in a, with, with a tile that sort of sticks with the tiles that, that, and, and, and sort of actually fits with the, the quality of your house that you want to project with that house. Um, so at the moment, which is quite popular, is Elite, our, our top middle tile. Flat tiles are very in at the moment. A few years ago, it was Tuscan. So bottom left, cupola, the bold rolls, those type of things are very in. Um, doesn't say you can't use it anymore. Um, that we've, we make all these tiles and they're all, all are readily available. The, the, bottom, the bottom middle one, perspective, when you start putting it together, that very first concrete tile roof that you saw, it almost looks like IBR sheeting, actually. So you get that effect of an IBR roof, but it's a concrete tile. I think the next slide, um, yeah, that's, that's a flat tile we mentioned earlier. Yeah. You know, if you, if you, you want to barn, you know, barn a, a farmer style, um, it, it, it does the job. Yeah, it's a nice, it's a, it's, uh, this is quite a stunning roof as well. It's, it's so unique, it's so modern, 
And I, th I think for in these days and times, this is a, a, a perfect type of roof that we we be doing a in a lot of estates as well, um, because it's 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 modern. Yet you can use it as as a normal pitch roof, you know, as a, a traditional roof. Just gives it that little bit of an edge uh, over the double Romans of, of the complex next door. Could I just mention something, Willem? The the Marseille tile. If you live in Rosebank, Parktown North, Parktown, etc., you probably have that tile on your roof. Yeah. Um, so the good news is these guys can, yeah, we've, can we, help you out. Yeah, we've got about three or four different sources in, in Europe that we can s s source these Marseille tiles. The, the only concern is those tiles were also sourced from various people, so they're all different sizes and so on. What we generally can do for, or what we suggest for, for, for consumers is that if you really need to renovate and, there's, and you need quite a, a, quite a large amount, they might not fit. So what we always say is like take the new tiles and put them on the roadside where people can see the new, you know, the new side of the roof. Maybe replace the ridging and use the old tiles in the back. So you can, and, and in, in time then you can change the back end to the new tiles. There, thereby you don't replace a whole roof with new tiles as, as such. So that's a way of, of getting around that, that situation. I think the next slide, um, Willem, just relates to, to coated tiles. Now what we're now doing as well is we pre-coat our tiles just to give it a bit more vibrant color. Sometimes your concrete tiles are a bit more dull. Now it's a costing as well. So we do offer a coated tile. Uh, this, is, this, is in, uh, a, a, this is an estate that burned down in the Eastern Cape in, in, uh, uh, with fires, uh, it was all thatched, so they're redoing it, and it's all this is all coated, um, so it just gives you also the a bit more vibrant colours. This is our elite with a, with a, a black uh, coating on. Um, Covenant also offers a, a couple of um, accessories, if you like, um, radiant barriers. We have one of these workshops coming up in the next couple of months, um, talking about insulation, how to insulate a home, but. Coverland do have a product. Yeah. Um, so your, what, what we do with our, our Jiproc friends, uh, or Isaver's got, they, they, they do a lot of bulk insulation. And what, what we try to do is combine the two, the two products from insulation point of view. You, with everybody who's building now will know you, your roof has to be insulated. So what we say is, yes, use a radiant barrier under your tiles or under your sheeting. What, what that does, any water that will come through, okay, firstly, it, it, it insulates the roof because it reflects the heat out. So you only have like 3 to 5% heat traveling through into the, to your roof space. A roof tile can heat up to 80 degrees in summer. So that's quite a lot of heat that goes into your roof. And you, most of you know how hot it is in your house in summer if it's not insulated properly. Um, what we then say is to, to, to reach a relevant R value for that is use a combination of like the eyes of a bulk with the with the radiant barrier to to reach your r value on your roof because your your radiant barrier is also a uh, uh, makes your roof weather tight so it, if, if it you have to have dry have, if you do have driving rain that drives wind or water and in the into your roof space it'll run out out the eve so you don't have any damage onto your ceiling boards or so on if you if you have an existing home with a tiled roof one of the one of the really lousy things about it is that um, contractors generally put the ridging on with, with mortar and they crack up in that. So on the next slide, uh, we're hoping there's a picture of that. There we go. Yeah. I mean so who's seen that? <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, that's like the common thing around. And, 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 and it's sort of accepted, it's, it's accepted that you, you know, after a while you fix your ridge line and that's what it looked like. Um, but if you're paying all that money for a decent roof, you know, this is not what it should look like or it doesn't or doesn't have to look like that so we've got a system called dry ridge you'll see there does it you know is that actually fixed yes it is um, it's, a, it's a system called dry ridge it's a peel and stick a roll that goes under the in place of the mortar under the tiles um, your tiles are then mechanically fixed with a clip to this to to a batten that's underneath the the, the ridge line so you what you have is a clean ridge line uh, I mean, it just looks amazing. There's no more worrying about, okay, is it, it going to leak or not going to leak? Um, if you have to fix a, a normal ridge line, you're going to pay 350 to 400 rand per linear meter to fix. And if you've got a 100 meter uh, ridge line to fix, that's, that's, that's a lot of money. Uh, and it's you're going to have to do it every now and again yeah. as well. 
Um, you also have a couple of flashing products. Um, flashing is around chimneys and parapet walls, so they don't leak into the actual yeah. roof volume. You know, so we've got a product called Easy Flash. It's available at builders. Um, I've got some brochures outside as well. And, um, and it's, yes, it costs a bit more, but you know, it's, it's a product developed in Germany, tested in Germany, it lasts for 15 years. Who is Jiprock, Paul? Well, Graham, Jiprock is part of the San Gobain Group. We've been in <coughs> business for an incredible 351 years, and that started in France, and we dotted all over the world. But San Gobain Jiprock is a business that's involved in plasterboard and the systems around plasterboard for walls, for ceilings, and for most anything that you can imagine. Predominantly in internal applications, but as technology is evolving and working with our sister company, such as Weber and Isova, we have systems now that will take you right through the wall. You have a new, ecologically friendly, light environmental impact building solution for South Africa and following the trend adopted in the United States, Europe and Australia. Paul, cool. while we're talking about systems, um, what you guys offer, although you manufacture boards and, and stays and whatever, um, describe your walling systems to us. I think one of the key things when you look at lightweight building materials, you take the experience that you have and you isolate it into the space that you've known in your business. And that's where some of the issues around drywalling and perceptions come. Now drywalling systems are in fact a range of solutions for everyday challenges. Let's speak about your home and the home that you're about to build or considering planning. If you have a look at various stages of the build, there are things that need to be considered. And one of those, for example, is moisture. If you have your kitchen, your bathroom, one of the key challenges that you have when looking at that whole package is how am I going to handle moisture, the transmission thereof, how I'm going to deal with it, and how am I going to construct that area so that it's healthy, it looks good, performs as I want it to do. And it is in the space that San Gaban Jiprock has unique solutions in a system. So let's speak first of all about your general area. When you have a look at any room, and particularly in your home, we want to speak about multiple comforts. Multiple comforts include your acoustic comfort. I'm sure all of you have been in a hotel room late at night and the shenanigans next door you've heard. <laughs> Not unfamiliar. Or the teenager with the latest hits and you trying to do something else. Now with our acoustic wall solutions, you can overcome much of this. You have a situation, for example, where you can drop down by as much as 60 decibels through the wall. But it's important that it is a system. So what we have is we have a wall frame of special steel. It's not just any steel, but it is corrosion resistant steel. It has specific flexing properties. And to that, on the one side, we do plasterboard, gypsum board, that has particular properties. In the cavity, we put glass wool insulation, which does two things. One, it provides acoustic comfort. In other words, it absorbs sound. And then secondly, as part of the total package, that glass wool gives you thermal comfort and it keeps stable. Then we go to the other side of the wall. And then we can put a multitude of boards. So on the one side, for example, you will be wanting to hang your new flat screen television that you're so proud of, but you think, I can't do that. I can't do that on a drywall. In the office, it doesn't work. <coughs> well, in the office, it does work when it's planned correctly, but in the domestic environment, we have very specific high-performance walls, and one of those is a product called Hibito. And this drywall is impact-resistant, it's fire-resistant, and you can take your large flat screen television 
and you simply countersink your screws as you would in a plaster wall, but you don't need the drill, which is really good news, and it works for you. One of the crucial aspects of our systems is that they are a system. So you have components, you have the track, which goes on the floor and on the ceiling. Then you have the studs, which run between, and then you have your boards, you have screws, you have plasters, and you have tape. You put this all together, and it's correctly installed. Very important with drywalling is the overall experience is dependent on how it was installed. And I'm going to speak about that a little bit later. So we have also a fire resistant solution. By its very nature, drywall is not combustible. The only portion of a drywall that is combustible is the paper that sandwiches it but it is low combustible paper. So you can have in your house a wall that will resist fire for 30 minutes and that we seldom do. Typically we start at 60 minutes and we go through to 180 minutes of fire protection, which is crucial because we're not saying your house is not going to burn, but what we are saying to you is in the case of a fire, you know that you can exit that property, you can exit that house safely in good time and your structure stands. We know all too often uh, that there are tragedies that are caused by domestic fire and it happens so quickly in places like your kitchen, places like your garage. And for these particular areas, we can have bespoke solutions for your particular need. Steel frame housing in, in South Africa, Paul, I mean, steel frame's been around since the beginning of time. But in South Africa, it's still a relatively, I wouldn't say new, but maybe an unknown um, solution or a way of, of building. Is that something that's improving the awareness? Graham, the, the steel frame space is slowly developing. Uh, it's often seen in the high end of uh, residential development, particularly where people really want to express themselves with a, a new look, a different way, a architecturally innovative design. So it hasn't yet filtered down to the, to the bulk of residential building. I think one of the issues there, of course, is that while it is a frame and it's pre-prepared and brought on site, it requires a lot of planning and there are certain perceptions in the market <coughs> that something that is just a frame and put up um, is not going to be as good as a solid block that's been put down brick by brick um, type of construction. So it is gaining acceptance, but I think more importantly than pure steel frame construction, we're seeing the emergence of hybrid steel frame, where you have an outside, which is traditional brick, and your inside walls are now moving towards uh, either load-bearing or non-load-bearing steel construction. Just to mention something, mention something, Paul, um, somebody spoke to me in the foyer, and I'm sure there are a lot of people here altering homes. If you're using one of these walling systems, you don't need to put foundations under it. So if you, you, you want to knock a wall down in your bedroom and move it to there with a brick wall, you would need to speak to an engineer whether that surface bed can hold the wall up. Obviously, with a lightweight wall, it's a bit more flexible. Paul, um, introducing the system or these systems that you're talking about, I would guess your target would be to architects. But when it comes to building contractors who ultimately um, are involved with this structure, particularly in a hybrid structure, and the homeowner, how do they find out about this stuff? Well, I think you ask a really appropriate question. How do you find out about it? Of course, we're moving into a, a media space and everything is out there on the internet. The Sangaban Jiprox site 
at jobrock.co.za is there. We have illustrations, technical details, how to. You can go visit YouTube. We have a number of clips on YouTube that start right at the beginning. What is drywall? What are the components? How to assemble it so that you've got familiarity. In no way do I propose that you try and do drywalling yourself. That's, that's not something that you should try and do. Trust me. Before I was in this business, I tried it once. It was a dismal, dismal failure. Don't do it. <laughs> However, there are specialist contractors. You typically find them in the ceiling and partition space that have attended training courses by people like Sanger Manager Brock and practice it on a daily basis. It is a craft, particularly when it comes to plastering. There's nothing quite as wonderful as seeing a beautiful skimmed finish. And all that information and how to and where to and get all the, the components for these systems is available from our website. And we also have a helpline that you can contact and the details of that are available on our website. Paul, before we, before we go on to a project called Stand 47, just to make it clear that what we are talking about is another system. So the, the contractor arrives with the boards and the metal and, the and puts the project in. Um, as you said, um, even if you know a bit about building, it's not a DIY project. You need the right tools and so on. So like the roofs, we talked about the concrete earlier on, the kitchen that we mentioned. Remember, the Easy Life guys are here. Um, walling systems, one contractor, one price, one guarantee. It's the way... It's the way to plan, it's also the way to, to build. So Stand 47, Stand 47 was our move to show people in Gauteng what lightweight building structures are all about. We took a brave decision to go and partner with Monaghan Farm and in this beautiful setting just north of Lanseria, we built a house. Now, what's very important about Stand 47 Graham and everybody here today is that it is not a once-off project. This is our commitment to sharing with South African society the way that we see your home evolving and being a multi-comfort space. Now, Stand 47 is entirely steel frame construction. You'll have a look at the photographs and you'll actually see um, some rock cladding. It's steel frame and yet it is rock. This project was built and developed to evolve. Inside, I don't have an interior photograph to share with you, but it has a mono slab and it has two areas. It has a wet area and a dry area. And I've spoken about the various wall systems. These walling systems are in there. And at a point in time, as a family evolves, we can move the walls. When you move a dry wall, it's not like a traditional mortar wall. It's a dry system. So you don't have the building rubble that you think you're going to have. With a correct contractor, they can come in and reconfigure a room or two all in a day. As simple as that. And this is a living example of that. But of course, when we think about multi-comfort, we've got to think of a number of facets of that. We've got to think about acoustic comfort. We've got to think about thermal comfort. And what we did with Stand 47 was we ran competitions and invited people, normal Gauteng residents, to spend a weekend in Stand 47 and live there and experience it. Because when you walk into one of these homes, there is a little magic that happens. We have special products like Active Air, which absorbs formaldehyde from the environment. This comes from carpets. Volatile organic compounds are in our everyday life. You find it in the plastics that our food com comes packed in. You find it in your furniture packaging. You find it all over the place. But when you're in these homes, the walls actually can absorb these compounds and it gives you fresh air. This home is wonderfully thermally stable. So you come in and its temperature never moves by more than two or three degrees. 
if it's cold day, you start the fireplace or you switch on a, a, a heater, whatever the case might be, that you choose to warm the place, pretty soon you're switching it off because the home is thermally stable. Sound, you sit in the lounge, watch TV, and the children are next door in the first bedroom, they can't hear you because the system was designed to cocoon you. So stand 47, which unfortunately now has reverted to the owners and they are living there. Um, its story has come to an end, but it has its own website and it has its own Facebook page. And I encourage you to take a few moments, either on Facebook or uh, on, a, on a browser, and go and visit stand 47. The story is there. And we continue with this. We've got a new exciting project in the Western Cape uh, with the Valdevi estate, where we will be doing this for folk in the Western Cape. The Brock right. have a, a, an office full of um, professionals, architects, engineers, and so on. So if you're designing a bulkhead in your kitchen or you want something special done, they'll do it for you for free. Remember what we said about using specialists. Um, walling systems, I mean, we know the answer to the question, but I need to ask it. <laughs> okay. We're talking about um, um, your systems can handle concrete roof tiles or um, shed type roofs, etc. I think the most important thing to understand is that these particular warding systems that we're speaking about are non-load bearing. So they demarcate, they partition areas. They are not designed for you to put a second floor on, a mezzanine floor or a roof. If you want to put a roof on it, and we're talking about the external walls now, would the framework then be designed to accommodate the roof? That is correct. Yeah. The focus then, then you move to steel frame, frame system building, and it can either be heavy duty, which you will find in tall commercial buildings, all the lightweight steel framing that we speak about in one or two story buildings. And into that, we put our portion. Uwe, welcome. Thanks for, for coming to chat to us here. Thank you. Uwe's from MyTech. Uwe, just quickly tell us, who's MyTech? What do you guys do? <laughs> Very simple. We started in 1955. We invented the actual nail plate system, which set the world going in making prefabricated roof trusses. Um, that technology came to South Africa in 64 through MyTech. So the concept's been around for a while. And it's surprising that there's still companies out there trying to do site mate roof trusses. Um, because first of all, the skills are gone that used to exist to do that. And the, uh, the only way to, to do it correctly is to use a prefabricated roof truss. MyTech don't only do the, we supply the components, the technology, the software, the training, um, the whole range that is required to make roof structures. We don't supply the public directly. We operate through licensed suppliers, such as builders or various other companies. And we are always available to provide assistance to professionals, architects, and even the public or recommend the public to go to one of our suppliers. Uber, the covering on a roof, whether it's um, concrete tile or, or a metal tile or slate or something, that, that drives the roof truss um, design and obviously also the cost. And, and as homeowners working with an architect, and again, hopefully the architect can give you this advice or just remind him to give you the advice. Um, these initial discussions about I want a farmhouse styled roof and that should be tin or what, what, Im what are the impacts on the trusses? The roof covering is after all what um, the roof has got to withstand. So it starts off with the covering and then the structure is designed in accordance with that. Um, roof covering, even though it could be light, like metal sheeting, doesn't mean that your roof structure is going to be less expensive because engineering principles come into play. And that means that a light roof covering is not necessarily a cheaper roof. In actual fact, in most cases, it is slightly more expensive. And it doesn't make sense, so I'll keep it very short. Roofs have to withstand 
dead loads and live loads. That means loads that are permanent and loads that are caused by wind forces, people walking on the roof for servicing. Um, and in the case of a lightweight roof, it will not collapse going downwards because it's so much lighter, but the wind will try and tear it off the building. So it has to withstand all those loads and that makes it work in the opposite direction to a heavy roof, which would be a concrete tiled roof structure. In this country, it's been proven that on average, a concrete tiled roof structure is the most economical. Um, the difference can be as little as 5% between light gauge, but if you go to other roofing materials, it can be 15, 20% more expensive than a concrete tile roof. The shape of a roof as well, or, or the type of roof, um, Uber, and if we looked at a, a gable to gable, and I think everyone might understand you know, a gable being a triangular shape with a ridge on it, it's probably your most cost effective, but you can also get very complicated roofs. Uh, the second aspect that definitely involves the costing, you touched on it in your intro, that the two different houses, same square meters, but big costing differences. Roof structures the most simplest of roof shapes is also the cheapest roof structure. So the RDP type of house or the barn type of house with two gable ends, not very pretty, is definitely the cheapest solution. And if you look around in the old parts of Europe, all their houses are little gable to gable boxes. Why? That was the simplest, cheapest roof. But as we advance, we want complicated shapes, very nice, like that picture there with hips, valleys, and even all sorts of other things thrown into it. And to give you an example, that just one hip, what's the difference? 30% increase in the cost of the roof structure. You add more of these in, and the facet expands. Um, roof shapes is one aspect that brings up the cost. As I said, hips will add 30%. Next comes the actual design or the interior of the roof shape. If you're happy with a flat ceiling everywhere, that's again a cheaper solution. If you want vaulted ceilings and all kinds of other features, which are becoming more and more popular worldwide due to our <coughs> I'm going to say flair for more interesting rooms, but that adds cost. What I suggest is that in the early planning stage, you plan your house the way you would like it to be, but then plan it in stages. You can always, based on the budget, start with your desires, but then let them evolve. So you have a two-bedroom house. Um, Uber, on to your um, different trust systems. Well, I mentioned it um, in the beginning. You obviously, what is not shown there, you get site made trusses as well. Um, I've got to put that on the cards. Um, however, in accordance with the code, all structures need to be signed off by an engineer. And um, because, unfortunately, that's not always done for various reasons I don't want to get into, but this happens. Um, to avoid the pitfalls of having a site made truss, which then actually was not, from an engineering point of view, adequate. And we've seen this in complaints coming in and advice that's required. Beautiful large houses, even in fancy estates, site made. Three years later, the roof structure is starting to give in, collapse. And often the only solution is to actually remove the whole roof structure and replace it. So I do not recommend it. If it's done, please involve a professional engineer who must inspect it. The preferred choice is to go to a proper engineered system, like what we represent, which can provide you timber or light gate steel roof trusses. Uh, they're always certified. And that's what makes it a system, just like the other presenters said. It means that everything that is required from the structure to the finish, to the sign-off, to the occupancy certificate is all provided. With regard to systems, um, generally the homeowner 
um, if you have a contractor, wouldn't get involved with the ordering in the, of the roof, et cetera. But you certainly need to be involved with the design. Um, as, as has been mentioned, it can impact on the aesthetics and it certainly can impact on the, on the cost. But just quickly, the procedure would be um, the architect would give the drawings to, to one of um, Mitex suppliers and Builders Warehouse, or Builders is a good example. They would then give it to the factory and the, the engineers to work out a price on a very, very sophisticated piece of software, or no, piece of software, <laughs> it's a design engineering software that designs the whole roof, um, that produces the quote, and then can be sent to the factory for fabrication. Um, the trusses are sent to site, erected by um, a contractor. What happened in the past, you'd, have, you'd probably have a carpenter on site, you'd have a tiler putting the tiles on, you'd have a plumber doing the flashings. Within a system, it's one contractor. Gives you the price for the trusses, the tiles from Coverland, puts it up with the flashing. One stop, easy to price, easy to get the price during that tender system so the contractor doesn't have to say, well, wait up, I still haven't got a roof price because it takes too long to work out. It's easy to, easy to get. The benefits, um, Uwe, of, of a system. Graham, it's exactly what you said. Um, it starts off in that process. The benefits are that it's software driven. So the, the probability of making an error is to a large degree eliminated. The software we create is extremely fancy and yet user-friendly. So it's designed especially for the trust manufacturers. Uh, we have certain criterion where they come back to us and we check certain structures that fall within those parameters, i.e. are more complex. Um, that gives you peace of mind. The supplier then in a complete package like that includes all the labor aspects, everything is parceled into it, so the, the user or the contractor benefits out of a one supply shop scenario. Now, not every one of the MyTech suppliers offers that package, but companies like Builders certainly do, and there's a couple of others. The backup is there, so there's, if there's any question, say, like the building's finished now, Two years later, you need to uh, do some modification or you want to add extra weight to the structure of any kind. Could be a canopy or something that gets added. There's that full design, so it can be traced all the way back. Now, my take is ISO uh, audited as well. So therefore, the, uh, that means that every step of the manufacturing design process is recorded and kept, like all engineering documents. That's, that, that's quite a truss or a beam. Or, um, how do we handle that with a prefabricated system? It depends what you're using. Um, it is a beam, so it can either be of laminated timber, it could be solid timber uh, if the spans were smaller. Um, it could be of light gauge steel, which has a higher strength factor. And if that doesn't work anymore, then it has to be of hot rolled steel. And this particular example yeah. was hot rolled steel. Modern architecture or contemporary ar architecture uses a lot of glass where, where your, your fenestration, which is a fancy word for windows and doors, um, links up with the roof and the truss becomes part of the window and so on. But there are specialists out there that, that, that can handle those, those um, challenges. While I'm chatting to you, Uber, uh, just another point, um, and it and it's relates to covering as well. With solar energy and solar geysers and so on, things are being put on top of the roof. Now, obviously, if you, you guys are designing the roof, your engineers, are, they need to know about these, these fittings or these mechanical devices. It is today um, almost by law required, certainly. We tell all our suppliers that you must always make allowance for a solar unit. Um, there is people who take shortcuts and don't do it, but it does have an impact. Obviously, anything you put on a roof structure will make that structure heavier. It's also going backwards. I mentioned earlier, if you chose a light gate, lightweight sheeted roof, you cannot then change that roof later on and put concrete tiles on it. It won't work. Thanks for joining us. 
If you would like to watch any more of the workshops in the homeowner series, follow the BuildAid YouTube channel or visit our website, buildaid.co.za, where you can view a full range of our product offering. To book your seat at our next workshop, visit caxtonevents.co.za. Don't forget to tune in to Mix 93.8 FM Wednesday evenings from 6pm to 7pm to listen to the Build Aid Show.